This week on Cosmic Sponge, it's the history of Bigfoot, where we take a look at the origins of the legendary North American ape, also known as Sasquatch, and Jimmy tries his hand at his very own Bigfoot call. Do your Bigfoot call now. All that and more, so stick around. We have a good one for you. Welcome to Cosmic Sponge, the podcast where we talk about UFOs and other weird wonders of the world. I'm Stephen Hawk. And I'm Jimmy Cope. We have a pretty special show planned for tonight because we have, of course, as I said in the intro, mostly talk about UFOs, but we want to talk about other weird wonders of the world. And the weird wonder of the world that we are talking about tonight is Bigfoot, a.k.a. Sasquatch. That's right. We're going to do an episode on the Squatch. <laughs> the Squatch? Yeah. Are you, you excited? <laughs> I know nothing about the Squatch. I mean, a little bit. I, I think he was in an episode of, what was that cartoon I grew up with, Scooby-Doo? Wasn't he in Scooby-Doo once, Bigfoot? I'm sure he was. He gets around. He is no doubt the most famous cryptid in North America. Perhaps the world. Oh. So before we get started with that, though, did you run across anything interesting since the last time we got together? Yes, I did. So uh, Lou Elizondo, the previous head of ATIP, the government program for these aerial phenomena that everybody's been going crazy about the last few years, he ran it from 2007 to 2012. He's on the record of saying that the U.S. government has confirmed, or he's confirmed, that the U.S. government is considering the extraterrestrial hypothesis. So I thought that was interesting. It's like a an almost government agent <laughs> saying that the government is saying extra. But, I mean, haven't they always sort of done the extraterrestrial hop- hypothesis all the way back into the 1940s? Are you talking about the upcoming report that's already been released to Congress on UFOs from the Pentagon? Nah, just that Lou recently in an interview made statements that said the U.S. government has in the past actively considered and is presently still considering whether the most extraordinary unidentified flying objects are not of earthly origin. End quote. (laughs) I gotcha. I I know that, uh, I mean, the stuff I've seen, the stories that have allegedly, quote, quote, leaked out from the report that's already been delivered to Congress, they're not saying they're extraterrestrial, but they're not ruling it out. Maybe even said something like, it's highly unlikely, but we're not ruling it out. Look, man, nothing is going to come from the Pentagon. Zippo. Zero. (laughs) It, It will change absolutely nothing. The Pentagon, the CIA, the NSA, the government wants to keep anything like this from the public because they're worried there's going to be a big controversy and another crazy hysteria about ufos and i don't think they have all the answers in fact i think they have very few answers and they don't want to be asked the questions yeah that's probably true i think they want this to go away the same way they wanted to to go away in the 1950s and so i think this is going to be kind of a short-lived thing i think it'll fizzle out they should outsource it to public companies (laughs) a division of microsoft or raytheon (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> the Raytheon Corporation. <laughs> Call yeah, me. for sure. I have another thing here, if we want to jump yeah. into something else real quick. Um, sure. So have you heard of the flying man? Like, people seeing men in the sky dropping and stuff. Where they have, they strap rockets on their on their backs and, and go flying with, like, a little wing on them? Is that yeah. what you're talking about? No, I'm talking about this, like, almost paranormal supernatural thing where they're saying, like, there's aliens or... Oh, dimensional people jumping out of the showing up in the sky flying around i saw a video from south america that appeared to show some type of humanoid looking figure flying through the sky i did see something like that so now i know what you're talking about yeah yeah. well you've also got those like uh gliding suits Mm-hmm. You've seen yeah, those, right? I thought that's what you were talking about at first. No, no, no. So there's the supernatural kind of thing that people talk about. You see those sometimes on the web. And then you got like, it could be confused because it could be a person actually using one of those could well, be. bat suits or whatever they're called. I don't know what they are. But now you have like an Iron Man suit, a legit Iron uh, Man. Uh, right. Uh, there's uh, a, uh, <laughs> <it's>, <laughs> <laughs> So there is this company called Gravity Industries that have these little hand jets. And then the back, those little wing suits, those glider suits, is the part of the legs. And then they have these, these jets. And you, you wear the fuel on the back, and you can go flying around in the skies. 
It's awesome. I want one. I'm looking at it right now. Jimmy posted this story on our Facebook page. So some of these stories we talk about are on there. So be sure and check it out if you're interested in uh, you know, becoming Superman on your own or Iron Man, I guess. You have to have the, the suit. Or what's the other one called that's like Iron Man something War, war Machine? Right. War Machine. All right, right. You're not a comic uh, book guy, right? I'm not a comic book guy, but I, I do see commercials. Right. About movies that are about comic books. <laughs> I've watched a couple of them. Yeah, so um, yeah, it's They're pretty good. exciting, yeah. The, they even show a scene on here where the guy uses it. It's like a commercial that they made where a guy uses it to go up as part of a rescue team and be a first responder paramedic to somebody who was at the top of this mountain and is injured. You know, it's a... A mock injury and it just flies up there sets down lights a flare so the uh so the helicopter can come pick him up one thing i'm looking forward to is once these become more common out there i'm looking forward to seeing the videos on youtube of people like you know flipping around and busting their ass because that is def- i would kill myself on something like that there is no doubt about it in air collisions there's a lot of things i would try but that is just not one of them oh i do it in heartbeat Really? Oh, you yeah. won't ride a motorcycle, but you would jump, uh, use a jetpack. Well, yeah, in the beginning until it got popular, because if you're up in the air by yourself, you just got to worry about ducks. Yeah. Maybe you're the odd sparrow, a mean crow. <laughs> Other airplanes, maybe? Drones? Yeah, drones, because people who fly drones suck. <laughs> well, not all of you guys out there, but a lot of you guys Not out there. everyone. Some people that fly drones suck. Not everyone. <laughs> Only, I know some non-sucking only, people that fly drones. Well, I only know two people who fly drones, and they both suck. <laughs> They're both good friends, <laughs> but they both suck. Suck at flying the drones or just suck as friends? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's move on. Let's move on. If you want to see the jet suit, check out Facebook. I wanted to do a little bit of an update from the Belgium UFO wave episode that we did two weeks ago. This is actually a report that I wanted to include in the show, and I had it on my screen, but I forgot to cover it that night. I found it interesting. This is the U.S. intelligence report on the... uh, You guys know, if you've listened to the show, you know I I love looking up declassified documents on on a lot of these, these things. So some of this is redacted, of course... Who it's from is redacted. I think it's to the Joint Staff in Washington, D.C. And some other people. But anyway, it's the intelligence report. So let's just leave it at that. Like I said, a lot of it's redacted. It was classified report at the time. And but they, you know, again, our intelligence people like the CIA, they'll be in, say, the French or Belgium embassy and we have spies there and all their job is is to read the newspaper just to find out what's going on in the country so that our intelligence people back in the united states know what's happening all around the world so this is how it goes there's a summary it says numerous ufo sightings have been made in belgium since november 89 the credibility of some individuals making reports is good some sightings have been explained by natural man-made phenomena some have not investigation by the BAF continues, and I'm sure that's the Belgium Air Force. Numerous and various accounts of UFO sightings have surfaced in Belgium over the past few months. The credibility of observers of alleged events varies from those who are unsophisticated to those who are well-educated and prominently placed. Leon Breedig, a 43-year-old professor at Free State University of Brussels, and it says in parentheses prominent, meaning he's an important person, I guess, in the field of statistics and physics. He claims to have taken pictures of the phenomena which are still being developed but will be published by the Belgium Society for the Study of Space Phenomena if they are of good quality, which they obviously were not. The other report that I had when I did do this episode had some really fuzzy, crappy-looking pictures. You couldn't tell anything about them. They just look like blobs. Here's another one, of the one where the, uh, which is in the episode about the engineering colonel for the Belgium Army goes over that report. At 20:30 hours, when he observed an airborne object approaching his direction from the north, it was in the form of a triangle about the size of a ping pong ball. <laughs> I don't think that's considered a massive object. What? What? 
Huh? Altitude appeared to be 500 to 1,000 meters, moving at slow speed with no sound. I swear that's what the report says. It had a yellow light surrounding it with reddish center varying in intensity. <laughs> did, the, did the Air Force send out any ping pong paddles? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then it uh, said the sky was cloudless and things like that. There's some other reports in here. I thought that was pretty neat. It mentions the Brower, the general who was a colonel at the time that ran the program. It speaks about the Brower specifically asking if there was B-2 or F-117 stealth aircraft in the area, which he says would not appear on Belgium radar. He had officially asked if any of those operating in the area, and the United States officially said no. Of course they did. It's not like, hey, do you have any secret planes flying over our airspace? Um, yeah. No. A NATO ally. Uh, nah, not no, really. Oh, man. No, we, no, no. Nothing over there. So anyway, it was pretty neat. That That's about it. It has some other stuff in there, Tara. Um, <laughs> we do have a ping pong ball flying over it. Yeah, well, I don't know what. That was very strange. <laughs> I don't know. Sometimes I think they mean it at, at arm's length. If you were holding a ping pong ball, that's what it would appear, I, I suppose. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. But. I don't know, but I mean, that's what, that's what the report said, so... <laughs> Doesn't sound like a whole lot to be concerned about. I wouldn't be afraid of a ping pong ball. Yeah, something that small. I just swat it away. I want to know what kind of glasses the guy's wearing to be able to see a ping pong ball at 500 to 1,000 meters in altitude. That's what I want to know. I want a pair of those. These aliens aren't threatening at all. They're the size of ants. (laughs) <laughs> yeah all right so that's uh that's it if anyone's interested just send send us an email or or uh, if you'd like to see that report we could paste that uh just just send us an email or... <laughs> you know what i would do if little what? ants crawled out of that ping pong <laughs> flying saucer i just get a magnifying glass <laughs> it's some kind of heat beam ah! <laughs> these evil earthlings <laughs> big or small we would definitely uh try to kill them there's no doubt about it it's what we do i have one other piece and it'll make a nice segue jimmy and i have talked about before we are both from west virginia we live in different parts of the state now he lives on the northern side i live on the southern side but just about dead middle in braxton county west virginia in a place called sutton they have just opened the west virginia bigfoot museum it's brand new it's been open about a week so on the weekend of june 26 they are having a Bigfoot festival in Sutton. Unfortunately, by the time you hear this, that weekend will have already passed. If you are driving through West Virginia and you have a few minutes, you know, stop at the Bigfoot Museum. Just, you can go to, they have a Facebook page, I do know that, the West Virginia Bigfoot Museum. And Jimmy, I reached out to them, and they are planning to come on the show. Fantastic. They already have, because of the festival coming up, they have two radio interviews and a television interview coming up. That's awesome. They may be very well be our first guest. And I also spoke to another place in West Virginia called Flatwoods, which was a ufo sighting back in the 1950s a landing and there was a scary creature involved and quite a few citizens saw it that is known as the flatwoods monster if any listeners have ever heard of that there's a museum nearby as well i talked to the owner of that museum he uh he may be coming on the show as well that'd be hoot yeah so i'm really hoping we get to do it can learn all about the bigfoot museum and perhaps the flatwoods monster and we can continue the discussion of bigfoot that we're getting ready to start tonight excellent Da-na-na, segue. so <laughs> that's a terrible segue <laughs> so like you had a stroke <laughs> well i am at that age <laughs> tonight's main topic is on bigfoot this is undoubtedly the most famous cryptid out there we are calling this episode the history of bigfoot because what we are kind of looking to do is a a big overview similar to what we did with the history of ufos declassified we're just going to talk a little bit about bigfoot maybe you've heard of bigfoot and watched a few shows on the history channel and know a little bit about it but we're going to try to uh, just do an overview of the topic in general hit a few sightings and things like that and then later on down the road we may dig into one particular aspect of bigfoot and explore that a little deeper do the deep dive as we talk about tonight it's only the shallow dive so watch your neck jimmy (laughs) would you jump it in i jump in feet first or i do a belly flop you look like a belly hey wait a minute it was deja vu 
<laughs> Never mind. <laughs> Let's talk about Bigfoot. What is Bigfoot? What are the common descriptions that are typically attributed to Bigfoot, a.k.a. the Sasquatch? Uh-uh. He's got big feet. That is one aspect. That is one very common aspect, hence the name. I'm a star pupil. <laughs> Very good, Jimmy. You're my only pupil. So, <laughs> so um, I think he's also really tall. Yeah, aren't they like uh, over seven feet tall or something like that? We all know thousands of people have claimed to have seen Bigfoot is most often described as a large, muscular, bipedal, ape-like creature, roughly 1.8 to 2.7 meters tall. And for us Americans, that's six to nine feet tall. Covered in hair, described as black, dark brown, or dark reddish. The hair is usually described as shaggy, but not really long, kind of shortish. And like you said, they do have the, the large feet and walk in a completely upright position. One thing that's associated with them is there's typically a pungent or foul-smelling odor associated with many reports of the Bigfoot creatures, described as smelling like rotten eggs or even a skunk. The face of Bigfoot is often described as human-like with a flat nose and visible lips. Common descriptions also include broad shoulders, no visible neck, and long arms. The eyes are often described as dark in color and have been alleged to glow yellow or red at night. Huh. I think it's important to point out at this stage, just a little speculation here, that no apes, uh, no hominids, or no apes species that I know about or have read about have eye shine. And eye shine is most typically associated with animals that have night vision like goggles well natural goggles i guess night vision goggles real quick here this is important to me so okay. if you have like the night goggles like you see in all the movies with the navy seals and it's all green looking and everything is that what like a raccoon sees with his shiny eyes you would have to ask a raccoon is a raccoon like like a navy seal <laughs> that's my question so i shine is called and i'm butchering this i'm sure but it's called something like tapetum lucidum it's because of the light kind of bouncing back but that is what enhances animals that have this that have the eye shine it enhances their night vision despite the fact that bigfoot is considered an ape or some type of hominid and no other species have it, he is also most commonly considered a nocturnal creature. And so maybe this creature, if he is a North American ape, maybe it, you know, it evolved some type of eye shine. I think it's plausible if the creature exists. So he's like a special forces giant ape. <laughs> well, you know, there are some people that think Bigfoot is a space alien. I watched a documentary on that not long ago. They think that Bigfoot is you know, dropped off by UFOs sometimes and then, I guess, picked back up. That's why we don't see him that much. We see him sometimes. So I guess maybe he just drops off on Earth for like a summer vacation or something. I did not watch that documentary. And then Bigfoot, according to some people is interdimensional and bigfoot can slip in one dimension out another to escape danger or something he slips into our dimension and then slips back out i did watch that documentary <laughs> and i watched two others that were a little better i watched uh bigfoot versus zombies and that was that was interesting and my favorite that's a documentary i thought that was a uh, like a fictional movie yeah, it's all one and the same to me when it comes to Bigfoot. And then there's, I know I'm going to get hate for that. So, And then there's you another should. one, which is great. And this is a fantastic movie. It stars Sam Elliott. It's called The Man Who Killed Hitler and Then Bigfoot. <laughs> it's a funny title, but it's a great film. And Bigfoot in it's a little different than what I expected. Well, with the title like that, I don't know what I would expect. You know, I'm trying to do a series podcast here, man, and you got to bring up like zombie Bigfoots and Hitler and Bigfoot. Come on. Hey, you're the one who started with the interdimensional Bigfoot and the Special Forces Bigfoot. According to some people, that is serious. <laughs> okay, fair enough. <laughs> For the record. Call me the skeptic. Stephen Hawk is going on the record to say that if Bigfoot does exist, that I believe that it is a natural creature. I don't, I don't think it's interdimensional. And if I'm wrong, you know, first contact at CosmicSponge.com. Let me know. Let me know what your evidence is. Well, let me go on the record, too, and say that before this podcast, I gave Bigfoot less than 1% chance. And after it, more than 1% chance that there's a Bigfoot out there. Well, at least that's progress. <laughs> it is. That is some it, progress. It's a little progress. Okay, listeners, if you go back to listen to Jimmy and I's very first 
first episode where we both kind of get a feel for each other's uh, where we stand on different aspects of the paranormal and that that sort of thing uh, yeah jimmy jimmy gave bigfoot a big fat zero but i know after he's done a little research for this episode he told me the other day that he's he's thinking maybe maybe so we'll see so anyway those are the most common descriptions of bigfoot also the habitat appears to be mostly the pacific northwest so i guess a temperate rainforest it's british columbia washington state Oregon and Northern California seems to be the range of Bigfoot, but I will add Bigfoot has been sighted, I think, in just about every state in the United States. I know Bigfoot has been sighted in West Virginia, for instance. Hence, we have the Bigfoot Museum going up in Sutton. Jimmy, I think you did the legwork. <laughs> Again, did the legwork on some of the history of Bigfoot pre twentieth century. Pre twentieth century, we got a little bit in the twentieth century, but just hit us with what you got. All right, Bigfoot, this mysterious hide and seek world champion <laughs> roaming North America, can also be found in just about every other corner of the world, or rather, not found in Australia. He's known as the Yowie. I'm the Moore in Scotland. Yaren in China. Yeti in Nepal. Mande Barung in Bangladesh, Nutluk A eh? in Canada, Orange Pendak in Indonesia, Hibagon in Japan, Mapingorari in Brazil, I know I slaughtered that one, sorry folks, Barmanau in Pakistan, and that's just to name a few. I mean, it goes on and on and on. This wild man is everywhere in culture spanning the globe. Yet today, we are here to focus on Bigfoot in North America. Now, the Native American tribes across the continent handed down tales of large wild men through oral traditions. Cave art discovered throughout the Southwest depicts large hairy creatures, which some have attributed to Bigfoot. While the oral traditions of Native Americans go back perhaps to the beginning of the arrival of man on the North American continent, one of the earliest written accounts of Bigfoot dates back to 1792 and was recorded in a journal named Noticias de Nucta, an account of the Nucta sound in 1792. Is that a French explorer? Or? Spanish, Noticias de Nucta. Oh. Well, it's hard to say with your accent. <laughs> I'm from West Virginia. Give me a break, man. Could have been Portuguese, I guess. Spanish. It was Spanish. <laughs> his, name, his name was Jose Moreno Mazzino. Spanish, oh, okay. man. Should have started with that. Noticias de Nutca. Buenas noches. <laughs> Gracias. <laughs> de nada. Aprendiendo sí. Español muy lentamente. The journal was written during a time when the exploration <laughs> of the Pacific coast was underway by the Spanish and English. In his journal, Monsino writes about a creature named the Matlog, which dwelled in the mountains and terrorized the Nutka tribe. Matlog was described as having a huge monstrous body covered in black bristle-type hair. The creature's skull was similar to a human's in shape, but much larger with sharp, strong fangs, similar to a bear or wolf. Its arms were long with curved claws on the fingers, and it was known to emit a terrible scream. It's no wonder the tribe's people believed the creature was some type of demon. Again and again, the stories of this creature would appear. In 1924, for example, a prospector, Albert Otsman, claims that he was abducted by a family of Sasquatch before he he escaped. And a few years later, a trapper by the name of Mochalat Harry was also abducted in 1928, managed to escape and make it back to a Nutka settlement, never again to enter the woods. Never? Apparently never. That's what they said. That's what that's what I read. It must be if true. You lived back then. I just don't know how you couldn't enter the woods. I, I know. I, at some point. I don't know. Maybe he sat on the couch, ate Doritos and played ping pong <laughs> with a little yeah, alien ship. Doritos, but yeah. <laughs> Uh, sightings continued to be reported until 1958 when something changed. But I'm at a risk of getting ahead of myself because Bigfoot up to that point did not exist. At least the moniker Bigfoot did not exist until a newspaper article detailing a story about large tracks discovered on a construction site. The paper was the Humboldt Times, located, appropriately enough, in the town of Eureka, California. Which a lot, Harry. Here's his account. It says, one night, while wrapped in his blankets and clad only in his underwear, he was suddenly picked up by a huge male Bigfoot and carried off into the hills. He was not carried very far, probably a distance of about two or three miles at the most, when daylight came. Wait, whoa, 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 whoa. Two or three miles is not a lot? Man, I can't, can't walk. When you're out in the woods and you're a trapper. I guess not. Okay. Sorry, go on. When daylight came, he was able to see that he was in some sort of camp under a high rock shelf surrounded by some 20 
Bigfoot. Now that's another thing. That's a question. Is it Bigfoot as in plural? Like if it plural Bigfoot, more than one Bigfoot. Is it Big Feet? Big, or should it just you know be Bigfoots or Big Footsies? Or just say Bigfoot like deer. You know, I saw twelve deer, so I saw twelve Bigfoot. That's the way this author's doing it. So I, I think I'd go with Bigfoot. I just go Bigfoot. Twelve Bigfoot. I think, I think so. Yeah. When daylight came, he was able to see that he was in some sort of camp under a high rock shelf surrounded by some 20 Bigfoot. They were of all sexes and sizes. For some, they stood around him and stared at him. The males in the front and the curious group of females behind him and the young ones to the rear. Harry was frightened at first and his fear grew to terror when he noticed a large number of bones lying around the campsite. When he saw these, he was convinced the big feet were going to eat him. <laughs> Now he used big feet, so I don't know. The big feet did not harm him in any way. Occasionally, one came forward and touched him as if feeling him, and when they discovered that his skin was loose, it was in fact his woolen underwear, several came forward and pulled at it gently. So some of the big feet seemed to slacken, and while most big feet in our camp probably food gathering, there came an opportunity. He leapt to his feet, ran for his life, never looking back. Ran all the way home. Uh, don't know. It says he... The story I read, he passed up his campsite. He ran all the way back. Suddenly there was a series of wild cries from the waters of the inlet. Lights were lit and he and others hurried down to the water's edge. That was a father, a priest. And he said there, near frozen and exhausted in his canoe, lay Mushalot Harry. He was barefoot and clad only in his wet and torn underwear. And he had paddled his canoe through the winter night, 45 miles from the mouth of the Kanuma River. So that was a harrowing episode. In 1955, this would have been slightly before the Humboldt Times article that we're going to get get to here just a second. William Rowe claimed to have encountered a female Bigfoot in October 1955 in the mountains of British Columbia, about 80 miles west of Jasper, Alberta. And this is his words, I had been working on the highway for about two years. In October 1955, I decided to climb five miles up Micah Mountain to an old deserted mine just for something to do. I came in sight of a mine at about three o'clock in the afternoon. After an easy climb, I had just come out of a patch of low brush into a clearing when I saw what I thought was a grizzly bear in the brush on the other side. I had shot a grizzly near that spot the year before. This one was only about 75 yards away, but I didn't want to shoot it for I had no way of getting it out. So I sat down on a small rock and watched my rifle in my hands. I could see part of the animal's head in the top of his shoulder. A moment later, it raised up and stepped into the opening. Then I saw it was not a bear. This, to the best of my recollection, is what the creature looked like and how it acted as it came across the clearing directly toward me. My first impression was a huge man about six feet tall, almost three feet wide, and probably weighing somewhere near 300 pounds. It was covered from head to foot in dark brown, silver-tipped hair, but as it came closer, I saw by its breasts that it was a female, and yet its torso was not curved like a female's. It, its broad frame was straight from shoulder to hip. Its arms were much thicker than a man's arms and longer, reaching almost to its knees. Its feet were broader proportionally than a man, about five inches wide, at the front and tapering to much thinner heels. When it walked, it placed its heel of its foot down first, and I could see the gray-brown skin on the hide of the soles of its feet. Finally, the wild thing must have got my scent. It looked directly at me through an opening in the brush. A look of amazement crossed its face. It looked so comical. At that moment, I had to grin. Still in a crouched position, I backed up three or four short steps, then straightened up to its full height and started to walk rapidly back the way it had come. And then it disappeared into the brush. Whether this was a Sasquatch, I do not know. It will always remain a mystery to me unless another one is found. Could just be a family with glandular problem. <laughs> like the wolf boy? Like the wolf boy, yeah, right. Running around naked in the mountains of British Columbia. A nudist colony. Yeah, that's good. Go for that. Sure. I know with that disorder where they grow hair all over their body instead mm -hmm. of just in the places that one would expect. And certainly she would want to be in the mountains alone because, you know, be embarrassed by the her condition of having this hair all over her body, but maybe she just likes to go naked and she has hairy breasts. And It'd be like wearing a coat all the time. Kind of, yeah. And then whenever the man saw her, it embarrassed her and she took off. You got it, Philip Class. Good job. <laughs> hey, that, that hurts, man. That's not cool. Jimmy Class. <laughs> Don't do that. Don't do that. 
I'm not that bad, am I? So earlier, Jimmy had talked about Bigfoot calls and screams. What I have is a recording of the first known Sasquatch scream recorded by Sergeant Kenny Cooper, a police officer, in November of 1976 while he was patrolling Chief Mountain Road in Washington State. So get a listen to this. And there you have it. There's the scream. What did you think? Sounds like a cat getting kicked in the groin. A big cat, though. You have yeah, to. I mean, a big cat, for sure. And the fidelity's not the best in the world. I mean, the tape's kind of old, and I, I'm not sure what kind of tape recorder he used. I'm sure just like a dictaphone type that they used back in those days. So I have a question for you. Did they uh, did they ever take that to like a, a biologist, a wildlife expert, and, and let them listen to it and see if they uh, could identify it from... That's an interesting question. I wish you would have asked me that before we did the podcast. And I would have did the research on that. Well, I was a little surprised because I didn't know we were going to have Sasquatch downs. Well, that's true. I mean, I was trying to save some, you know, I was trying to surprise you with a you few surprised things. You surprised me. Know what to expect. I didn't know what to expect, and I'm surprised for sure. Uh, we'll find out. That will be a follow up on our next episode. I have absolutely no doubt that on one of the many, many, Bigfoot documentaries and television specials that someone has taken this. I would be very surprised if they have not taken this recording and had it analyzed by someone. But on the other hand, those documentaries and Bigfoot shows will find someone who says, I've never heard anything like that. Well, I'll, I've been in the woods. And then it's a biologist come along. Oh, it's a screech owl. <laughs> you know, yeah. Or whatever. You yeah. know, they'll say it's yeah. so and so. Listeners, I will follow up on that next week, and I will answer Jimmy's question then <laughs> to see if there is any any type of scientific analysis ever done of this Bigfoot sound or some others. I know there's other recordings out there. And listeners, if you know about something, let us know. First contact at CosmicSponge.com. If you can point us in the right direction, find out if anyone has ever analyzed Bigfoot screams or calls. It was funny when I was on YouTube trying to find it because I knew about it. I ran across Bigfoot calling contests and it was like people making their own Bigfoot calls. And I think some of these television shows which I've never watched that go out in the woods with the night vision cameras and like trying to find Bigfoot. I know there's been several on um, reality type television shows. Apparently they call for Bigfoot on these shows because I saw a few clips of it. Really? So, so you've got like a producer sitting there going, Okay, Terry, it's time to do your Bigfoot call. Do your Bigfoot call now. Here, here you go. Here's one right here. Wow. Um, huh. I don't know what to make of that. Well, I don't either. I'm not a big foot. I'm just a normal foot. I, I'm an average foot. <laughs> You're an average foot. I'm a below average foot. I got small feet. I'm a small okay. foot. <laughs> small foot. Wondering. Hey, there actually there is a creature called little foot. Are you so just so, I'm just saying. Me? Be careful when you go on your backpacking trip this weekend because if you go around barefoot, you may be mistaken for little foot. You know, I'm going to take my camera with me. If I actually catch Bigfoot on film, I'm going to be like, this is crazy. <laughs> look, look, it's a Bigfoot. And people that would be awesome. Yeah, it would. We could sell it and make some money and retire. Let me ask you something. Yeah. If you did see, listen, and I know you have a very fancy camera rig. I do. Jimmy's Jimmy's somewhat of a part-time filmmaker. He has some really nice gear, some very expensive equipment. So you're saying you're going to take your high-dollar camera with you this week? One of them, yeah. If you did capture a super high-quality Bigfoot video, would you really share it? Heck yeah. You put yourself out there? I don't care. I'm old, man. I'm going to die one day. I, I want a Wikipedia entry. <laughs> 
You know what everybody would say? They would say it was a hoax. Sure. Okay. Especially if care. it looked really good. I think that's been part of the problem. I was going to save that conversation for a little bit later, but mm. I think that's part of the problem of some of the films that you see or clear pictures. They're just automatically, it's a hoax. It's a guy in a suit. Well, you can analyze the film and really get down into the nitty gritty of it and say, yeah, this is unaltered film. We can see it. Now it's a little bit harder probably with but digital unaltered. Film. I mean, somebody just walking by in a suit at a hundred yards. Well, you know, that's the other thing. So, I mean, if we talk about a lot of these films that I've seen and I put quotations and marks around those films because while they are moving pictures of sorts, it's more like very blurry, obscured pictures. The same complaint with most UFO photos and most UFO videos. Now, now this is one where I'm going to beat up on my fellow skeptics a little bit. Here's the problem, guys. Okay, you expect these perfect film footages off of average people with substandard cameras. First of all, unless you're somebody who films a lot or takes photographs a lot, and you're in a situation where something extraordinary is happening, I might be able to, if I'm really excited, I would probably go through the paces. I'd make sure that I was in the right mode, that I had my aperture set correctly, that I had my shutter speed set correctly, that I had my camera ready to go to shoot something before I actually brought it up to my eye. If I wasn't expecting anything exciting and I was just carrying my camera around, I'd make sure I had those settings because I know if I don't, it doesn't matter whether I get it up to my eye and and get it in focus and frame it. I'm not going to see anything. It's going to be garbage. So I will take the time to do that. I don't care how extraordinary it is. If I'm going to film something, I'll take the time to do that. It's almost like a journalist in combat zone. The more you do it, the more you get in the habit of going through this this mental list. It's like a golf swing. You know, make sure your head is down. You're looking at the ball. You're not going to bring your head up. You keep your arms straight. You don't break your elbow. It's like that. So skeptics, give these guys a break who are out there trying to do this stuff. First of all, it's a wild animal. It could be a bear instead of a Bigfoot. You want to be careful. You, you don't want people to get mauled to death. And, you know, they don't. They have substandard gear or they don't know how to use it or they're excited. And they're just, you know, getting bad film footage. But, yeah, I would share it. I would take my time. I would take the best possible footage I could and I'm a little crazy so I might actually run towards it (laughs) and then I'll be greeted by a mother bear with her cubs and that's the last time we saw Jim yeah maybe that has happened right disappeared in the wilderness where these things are so remote there's no doubt that if my mother was taking the picture or my wife for that matter that the head would be cut off you would just (laughs) see the body of Bigfoot you would see the body of Bigfoot and maybe half of it, and then the rest would be the woods over to the side. <laughs> this whole family of big feet have no heads. <laughs> yeah, not known for taking good pictures. So, and and you do make a very good point, very valid point. I mean, it, you know, you're walking through the woods or you're hunting. You know, with UFOs, you're just doing your everyday thing. I mean, I don't know how many people you're seeing this thing. This is super unusual. If you saw something that was eight foot tall and it was stalking through the woods, it'd probably scare the crap out of you. I just think, yeah, you know, it, it, you may not think to whip your camera out. And then if you did, by the time you did, it would probably be too far away to get a very good picture yeah you know there's actually um i wondered about this part so there's this amazing wildlife photographer I'm trying to remember his name he, he does a lot of wildlife photography he uses nikon i'm pretty sure in uh, mostly africa it does elephants tigers lions that kind of thing his photography and bears so mine. and bears his photography is absolutely stunning he goes out, he'll have these cameras set up with remote snaps and where he could either trigger it remotely from his hand or he'll set it up to where almost like a trail camera where they come up and it will snap. And the way he sets things up, you know, comes up with these really amazing images and they're crystal clear. I'm like, OK, why doesn't somebody like that go into the woods where everybody says these things are and set those cameras no up? I mean, you can tell by just the number of Bigfoot documentaries, by the number of Bigfoot shows, reality shows that are out there. I've seen it on those kind of shows and how many people are just doing it on their own. I'm sure there's plenty of them. Probably hundreds of people are trying to capture this thing. Uh, You know, trail cams are really popular now. Yeah, so they're not capturing it because it doesn't exist. Well, it could be that it avoids man and anything that man's around. That's why we don't see them very often. And there is quite a bit of wilderness in British Columbia and the Pacific Northwest. There's a lot of acreage that no humans really tramp around on very much. They also could be ninjas. 
<laughs> of course they could. Why not? Ninjas from UFOs that are Bigfoot. Or they're just pretending to be Bigfoot. Did you find the origin of the Sasquatch name? I ran across it here. I can't find it in my notes. I, what do you got? I did I did find the origin of the Sasquatch name. It's S-T-S apostrophe A-I-L-E-S. And I would guess that's something like Stas Alice. 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 Stas Alice. First Nation. Ha, uh, have First the, Nation. That's right. That's right. First Nation. Well, this and the and and typically can the Canadians call it Sasquatch more so than Americans. We prefer Bigfoot, apparently. Yeah, their name is actually the Indian name is S A S Q apostrophe E T S Sasquatch. Eights Sasquatch. I would say that Sask Eights Sask Eights. Okay. Um, and anyway, the supposed origin of the word Sasquatch. So let's talk about the origin of the Bigfoot name. As Jimmy had talked about earlier, in 1958, Jerry Crew, a logging company bulldozer operator in Humboldt County, California, discovered a set of large 16-inch human-like footprints sunk deep within the mud of the Six Rivers National Forest. Upon informing his co-workers, many claimed to have seen tracks on previous jobs as well as telling of odd incidents such as an oil drum weighing 450 pounds having been moved without explanation. The logging company men soon began utilizing the term Bigfoot to describe the mysterious culprit who had apparently left prints and moved their equipment, causing a sense of paranoia among the workers. Crew, who initially believed someone was playing a prank on them, once again observed more of the numerous massive footprints and contacted Andrew Gonzalez Zoli of the Humboldt Times newspaper, today it's called the Times Standard, in nearby Eureka. Genzoli interviewed the lumber workers and wrote articles about the mysterious footprints coining the term Bigfoot in relation to the tracks and the local tales of a large, hairy, wild man. A plaster cast was made of the footprints and crew appeared holding one of the casts on the front page of the newspaper on October 6, 1958. The story rapidly spread as Genzoli began to receive correspondence from major media outlets including the New York Times and Los Angeles Times. As a result, the term Bigfoot became widespread as a reference to an apparently large unknown creature leaving massive footprints in Northern California. Hmm. In 2002, the family of Crew's deceased co-worker Ray Wallace claimed that their father had been secretly making the large footprints with carved wooden feet and that he was responsible for the tracks. And so that brings us to Ray Wallace. He claims to have started the whole thing as a gag. A pre-internet troll. <laughs> That's what his family says. And he had some of these in on their property. I mean, in I guess in his woodshed or something. He had some of these fake carved feet there at, at, at the house. That's an OG troll. <laughs> So the construction crew, the loggers, and after it was reported to the Humboldt Times is where the name Bigfoot came from and kind of took off, especially in the West, in Northern California and the Pacific Northwest. In 1967, something happened that really put Bigfoot in the public's mind more than anything coming before that. And what was that? That was the Patterson-Gimlin film. Sometimes they shorten it to just the Patterson film or the PGF. It's an American short motion picture of an unidentified subject that the filmmakers said was a Bigfoot. The footage was shot in 1967 in Northern California alongside Bluff Creek, which is a tributary of the Klamath River, about 25 logging road miles northwest of Orleans, California in Humboldt County, which is where it got picked up again. Right, and I think it's interesting, quite interesting, that this phenomenon of Bigfoot b began in 1950. 58 in the same area, Humboldt County, Bluff Creek. I guess maybe it's a Bigfoot country. Well, Patterson didn't know where to capture film, and he was actually out there to capture film. You know, a skeptic would say how convenient that you actually got the film you were out there to capture for a documentary on Bigfoot. So, a little convenient. And uh, he was told... That's why he was there. <laughs> that's why he was there. So, maybe he was just successful. They were out there for a few weeks, right? I believe so. And uh, Roger Patterson died pretty young in 1972 i think he was in his 30s and he maintained all the way up to the end that it was the film was real bob gimlin has always denied being involved in any part of hoax with a patterson film we don't have anything there 
I think he made the comment in 1999, I read somewhere while doing the research for this. He said if it was a hoax, it was essentially pulled on him as well. Mm -hmm. I think it was real, but if it was some kind of a hoax, I wasn't in on it. I think that would have been practically impossible that he was spending all this time with him and then... How would he have you communicate it with whoever's doing the hoax and say, hey, be sure and be squatting by the river at 1230 on October 20th and we're going to come around the corner or top the hill and, and jump up and walk into the woods? Just, nah. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I don't know what to make of that. I'm skeptical by nature, so. It's one of two things. It's either real or it's a hoax. Yeah, and you know, I thought I was going to come out of looking at this and say 100% definitive it's a hoax. And I didn't come out saying that. I, I need to do more research. I need to look into it more because there is a lot of people who look at this, some serious scientists who look at this, who say, no, it's a hoax. And then some will say, no, there's no way it's a hoax. A little bit more research on my part to get into that to make a decision. I spent a lot of time looking at it. And I spent a lot of time looking into the details of the technology. I mean, one interesting thing is the original Patterson film is lost to time. No one knows where the original film is. All we have are copies. Now, the copies we have are very high quality, unedited copies uncut copies. There's a way they can tell that that is the case. So we know we have four copies that are as good as the original. I know that uh, his wife owns one, mm -hmm. Roger Patterson's wife, mm -hmm. and she's loaned it to certain people that make documentaries. And a few years ago, I watched a documentary, it may have been Monster Quest, I don't remember which one it was, where they digitized it frame by frame mm -hmm. off that film. Now again, it's not the original, as Jimmy said. And then took the computer and stabilized it. And if you go to YouTube right now, there's all kinds of versions of this that is being totally, totally stabilized. You can get such a good, clear image of this creature. But it's so funny because for years watching this through the years, and listeners, you may have noticed this, whenever the creature looks back behind itself, that hand kind of sticks up and it looks like it's sticking straight out. And it turned out that that was an artifact of the video of all the years that there's been copies and regenerations of video. Mm -hmm. And so in the newer version that they transferred and probably some subsequent ones as well, it's much cleaner now. I would urge you right now just to go on YouTube and check out the Patterson Gimli film. It's the famous film that if you've heard of Bigfoot, you have seen, and there's some good analysis of it. There were some people such as Grover Krantz. He was an early believer in Bigfoot. He was an anthropologist from Washington State, I think, mm -hmm. University. Grover, Grover Krantz, he passed away in 2002. He was an American anthropologist, one of the few serious scientists that believed in Bigfoot, and he most certainly thought that the film was legitimate. One thing that he noted that I find interesting about Bigfoot myself I've heard a lot of people be very skeptical about the footprints, but many of the footprints have what's known as dermal ridges. And what that is, is the same as fingerprints. Like apes and chimps on the bottom of their feet, and the same as the bottom of your feet, you have a print. A dermal ridge is what it's called. And so that's one of the first thing that Bigfoot researchers look for. If you find dermal ridges in the tracks, and then when you make the plaster casting of it they come out sometimes and i just think that would be a really tough thing to hoax i mean would a hoaxer even think of that to make a dermal ridge inside of the their fake footprint if they're making fake bigfoot feet to run around in the woods with or run around in the mud to make people think a bigfoot's around i don't know that that a hoaxer would think of that now, you know i was just thinking remember when you were a baby you probably don't remember when you were a baby but no <laughs> Have you ever seen your little birth certificate, your original one? Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. They take your toe prints. Have you seen that? Your feet. Yeah, your they feet. take your whole feet. Yeah, your whole feet. Right. Think about how big that birth certificate would have to be for a Bigfoot. <laughs> You'd have to use four sheets of paper. It would be a paper. big birth certificate. It'd look like one of those giant checks when you win the lottery. That's that would right. Be the... You'd need just a really, really big one. Yeah, there's there's the Dr. Jeffrey Meldrum, Idaho professor of anatomy and anthropology. He's done a lot of work in terms of analyzing some of the cast that have been collected over the years. Gives like a really good talk on several uh, documentaries and discusses the ridges that you just described, and as well as the Patterson film, how the Patty walks. Right, they call her Patty. Patty, I guess after Patterson. Right. The nickname of the creature. Yeah. And uh, so he's analyzed a lot of it and, and says, yeah, that's how you would expect a primate of that type to walk. And there's also, I guess, 
some indication that they may think it's a, a relative of Giantopithecus. And we mm-hmm. do have some DNA, not much, but we do have some DNA and jawbones and teeth. Several different locations where we have collected some of that information and been able to extrapolate out what the full head would look like. And then from there, it's guesswork about what the body size would be. But you can make some really good educated guesses based on what we already know about primates. And this might be some kind of relative of Giantopithecus. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, you'll see, and I, I'm trying to think, I think it was a Napier who first thought of that. Uh, but none have been found, no remnants of Giantopithecus has been found in North America, right? Just in... No. In in Asia. Asia. So, yeah. yeah, that theory was first put forth. It's It was a species that's been named Gigantopithecus. Pithecus. The only thing that has been found are a few lower jaw bones and teeth. Lots of teeth. They've been found in Asia. So the current theory is a descendant of Gigantus Pithecus migrated across the Bering Land Bridge the same way woolly mammoths and some other European species did during one of the ice ages where that land mass, there would have been a bridge. In other words, Siberia and Alaska would have been connected. We know from the fossil record, animals did migrate back and forth. There were a lot of North American animals. The camel, for instance, evolved in North America. So the idea is, is that even though they have found a few fossils, and again, it's very limited. I mean, it's the lower jawbone. The newest one is uh, 100,000 years old, has been carbon dated to. From that lower jawbone, knowing that it was a, a jawbone of an ape, they extrapolated the size of it, which was quite a bit larger than our great apes now. And I'm not sure how they determined that it could walk upright and be an upright ape as opposed to one that's hunched over, such as the gorilla. But that is one theory. There is also Jeffrey Meldrum who talks about that at length in just about every documentary you ever see about Bigfoot. He is on, on at length. And he talks very intelligently about Bigfoot and he believes it to be a real creature. Yeah, and I don't know if this is... It's just the way I think. No no offense to anyone out there, but if you're, let's say, you're my little brother. Sorry, sorry buddy, but I, sorry I keep bringing you into this. Yeah, He's an incredible hunter, so if I'm out in the woods with him, I'm going to defer to him when we're out hunting things. He's skilled in the woods. That's something he knows more about than I do. But when it comes to some unknown human-like animal in the woods, I'm going to trust somebody like Dr. Jeffrey Meldrum, PhD, professor of anatomy and anthropology at Idaho University, over my brother. Because, you know, my brother, he's going to look at it and immediately say it's Bigfoot. Me, I'll look at it and say, look, some ape done escaped from the zoo. <laughs> you know, any, you remember that from the water boy? Anybody ever catch that ape that uh, escaped from the zoo and punched you in the eye? No, mama. <laughs> the search continues. <laughs> You know, so um, he lends for me a lot of credibility to the topic. And he, for one, leans toward the possibility quite heavily that there is some primate out in the woods of the American Northwest, the North American Northwest, that may be out there in a large enough group. And this is another problem I've had. You know, when you say large enough group, how many is that? Bengal tigers, for instance, there, there's about 2,500 of those in the wild. So you would need about, you know, at least 2,500 of them. Now, I don't know when you start having problems with inbreeding. So, you know, you'll have, you know, big feet out in the woods are wearing the helmet on backwards and sniffing glue. I don't know when that happens. (laughs) But at some point... Sniffing bark. (laughs) Sniffing barks. They're Canadian. They're sniffing that maple. But (laughs) I I don't know when that occurs. I'd like a biologist to tell me, theoretically, what's the minimum viable number of big feet that you would have to have in a herd. Is it a herd? I mean, how would you, a tribe probably, um, that you would need in order to exist out there. And is there enough space for them to exist in anonymity, unseen? Probably clan. Clan. Well, they're not Scottish, unless they're that Scottish one. You know, I wish this, you know, if we have any Scottish listeners out there, can you let me know how to pronounce that uh, Scottish Bigfoot? Because, I mean, I'd really like to know. I, I, I love the sound of, you know. Because if it's not Scottish, it's crap. <laughs> That's right. So I want to know how you would pronounce that. A group of chimps is known as a community. So I guess we would just call it a community of big feet. Commun- Bigfoots. Community. Bigfoot. 
<laughs> it's, um, it's, I'm still stuck on that. Suburbia Bigfoot community. I have heard... <laughs> I have heard that it would take at least 500 animals to have a healthy breeding population. And and they could be, I mean, despite the one account we have from the 1920s, 1928, that someone was kidnapped by 20 or so big feet. Despite that, they're mostly seen alone, or at most two. So they may just be some type of nocturnal. And that could be another reason we don't see them as much, that is solitary and does those those crazy squalls and calls whenever it's ready to mate sort, sort of like big raccoons well mountain leopards you know something like that i was thinking of big raccoons i caught one of those recently had to uh, take it away because of killing my chickens but i mean you think about that raccoons sometimes you'll see like them in small groups like one or two but then sometimes right. you'll see them in big groups like i've seen them as many as five or six taking out my trash cans that's what i was going to say it depends on the food source right <laughs> so, I mean, they're just, you're attracting several and they're just, there's enough there to go go, go around, I guess. So they're not worried about it. That's that. right. You keep your trash cans inside the garage now and you don't have that problem. Right. Yeah. That's a little cosmic sponge tip for you. Yeah. <laughs> Keeping raccoons out of your garbage. Yeah, keep those trash pandas away. <laughs> what would you call a trash Bigfoot? What would you call them? Not a trash panda. A trash super panda. Hmm. <laughs> You know, but, you know, there's been some people who claim that they gotten into their uh, stores of food and the big the big feet come in and said, hey, these guys have got some salmon hanging out here in this shed. Tasty. So let's talk about a couple things like that. We've brought up a few ideas here. Let's let's come back to the Patterson Gimlin field. Sure. I've got it pulled up right here and I've, I've been actually running this thing in the background while we've been talking. Oh, back and forth. Yeah. Just running again on the loop. Mm hmm. Have any feelings about it? This thing's been around almost as long as I have, so I've seen it my entire life. Lately, with the new technology, the way they've stabilized it, you can see everything better than ever and enhanced it. I'd say it looks really legitimate, but then, especially now that it's been stabilized, I don't know, man. It, it really could be a hoax. I just don't know. The issue I have is you'll see all these experts get together. Let's say it's pro Bigfoot. And they'll give you a hundred reasons why that cannot be a hoax. And they'll talk about the fact that the foot comes all the way up and you can see the bottom of the feet. That people don't walk that way. They talk about the gait. They talk about the arm swing. Uh, They talk about the fact that it's a female. That when when it turns around, it obviously has two breasts. And they say, what hoaxer would have thought to make it a female? I think that's valid. They talk about all those things, and and the pro Bigfoot people say, look, you can just see the muscles rippling under the fur, right? Mm -hmm. And it sounds very convincing. And then I turn right around and watch a hoax show saying it's a hoax, and they're saying, look, you can clearly see the zipper in the back. Mm Mm-hmm. And to tell the truth, I can't see either one of those things. I mean, it's pretty blurry. I would say that if it's a hoax, it's a pretty good one. That the suit, if it is a hoax and that's someone in a suit, that's a pretty good suit. I read a excerpt where they just compiled a list of all of the Hollywood greats going all the way back to that period in time, including right after that, I think, is when we had the first Planet of the Apes come out. I know who you're talking about. That guy said he no way was involved with that. That's not what I'm getting at. They all weighed in on, after watching the film, whether they thought it was a suit or not. And the majority of them thought it wasn't a suit. But the few that did think it was a suit were very quick to say, yeah, that's a suit. I've heard that too. And again, there you go, right? It's exactly the same thing as Alien Autopsy. So many people watched it, and you bring in the Hollywood special effects guys, and half of them are like, if that's fake... I want to hire this guy. That's great. There's no, you know, it would be able to cost $100,000 to make this. And, and then the other half, it's like, it's fake because I can tell it's latex. or what. I mean, it's opinions about those things. And I know those people are Hollywood experts and special effects experts. But at the end of the day, you're still left wondering. stuck with half the people say yes, half the people say no. So, so breaking it down on several levels, I mean, the very first thing I would do being, you know, into the camera stuff and all was I'd be like, okay, what camera did they use? How many frames per second were they shooting at? Now, I believe they said 16. There's a little bit of a controversy about that. Right. Whether it's 16 or 18 frames per second. Uh, so it's a, it was a Cine Kodak K100 camera 
and it had a variable dial that you could set at 16, 24, 32, 48, and 64 frames per second, but no click stops. And it was able to film at any frame speed within that range. Patterson clearly told John Green that he found after filming that the camera was set on 18 frames per second. So I think we could be pretty certain that it was shot at 18 frames per second. Um, yeah. Yeah. I don't know why that would be a huge deal anyway. I think to some degree it became more important in terms of determining whether or not the copies were legitimate. Okay. At the end of the day, pretty much everybody agrees that the copies are really good copies. They're shot at 16 frames per second or 18 frames per second. But the... The one thing about them, I guess at the, my problem with it is this. If you have ever looked at film from that period of time, particularly 16 millimeter film, and you blow it up very quickly, it becomes extremely grainy and details are very hard to pull out of there. And I've seen some people who've digitized the original film or not the original, but the, the high quality duplicates. And then they introduce digital adjustments that they say are valid. But I can tell you, having done that myself, it's guesswork. And you're guessing off of grainy footage, which a lot of that can be just attributed to artifacts. Matter of fact, subsequent copies of that footage introduced artifacts that some people misinterpreted, say, as a thumb on one of the hands. So you got to be really careful when you're analyzing this film and looking at it. So I can really see where you could look at that footage, that 16 millimeter footage, because I don't want to see anybody introduce artifacts in. I, I don't trust that. I mean, that's subjective what you're getting there. So looking at that original 16 millimeter film, I could see where you could come away with it saying, yeah, it's a suit. I can also see where you come away with it going, nah, that's some uprighting, upright walking primate of some sort that nobody's ever seen before. Right. And that's my point. Exactly. I've seen the film over and over many times. And I hear one person say they see the muscles rippling and the other guy says there's a zipper in the back. And truthfully, I can't make out either one of them. Yeah, quality is just not good enough. Just like you're saying, when you're enhancing that, you know, if I'm a pro Bigfoot guy, I may enhance it to kind of lean in the direction of making it look more believable. Or if I think it's a hoax and I'm doing the digital thing, and then I may be trying to bring out something that makes it look like a zipper. But the neat thing is, is how they've stabilized the film where the shakiness is gone. And, and it is enjoyable to watch that way. You can tell much more about it. So let's talk about if it is a hoax. There are two main hoax stories that have emerged in the years since. The first one is a man named Philip Morris, and not to be confused with the cigarette company Philip Morris. Philip Morris is the owner of Morris Costumes, and it's a North Carolina-based company offering costumes and props. And he claims, now this was in 2002 that Mr. Morris made this claim. He claims that he made a gorilla costume that was used in the Patterson film. Morris says he discussed his role in the hoax at costume conventions in the 80s, but first addressed the public at large in 2002. Morris claims he was reluctant to expose the hoax earlier for fear of harming his business and for giving away a performer's secrets, he said. But he said that he sold an ape suit to Patterson via mail order in 1967, thinking it was going to be used in what Patterson described as a prank. But then there's another hoax story, and this is a gentleman known as Bob Hieronymus. And Bob Hieronymus claims to have been the figure depicted in the Patterson film. He says he had not previously publicly discussed his role in the hoax because he hoped to be paid eventually and was afraid of being convicted of fraud if he confessed. After speaking with his lawyer, he was told that since he had not been paid for his involvement in the hoax, he could not be held accountable. He came forward January 30th, 1999. And so he claims to actually be the one in the suit. And Hieronymus was an associate of Roger Patterson. Lived down the street from uh, Bob Gimlin. So, I mean, they knew each other. Mm -hmm. So, But there are problems with both of their claims. Morris said he sold the suit to Patterson, and it was the same suit that Hieronymus claims to have worn in the Patterson film. However, Hieronymus and Morris describe the suits quite differently. Hieronymus says that he was told by his brother Howard that Patterson claimed he manufactured the suit from horsehide. Bob replied, and that's Bob Hieronymus, replied that it weighed maybe 20 or 25 pounds. 
Bob said it stunk. Roger skinned out a dead horse, a red horse. So to him, the suit was made that way. Then Morris, who says he sold the ape suit, said the fur was made of Dinell, a lightweight synthetic material with little or no odor. And he said it was the standard gorilla suit that we sold to all of our customers, and it cost $435. Probably the biggest thing was Hieronymus said that the suit had no metal pieces and an upper torso part that he donned like pulling on a t-shirt. At Bluff Creek, he put on the top, asked about the bottom. He guessed it was cinched with a drawstring. So in other words, he said that it was a two-piece suit that he put on the top and then I guess the top hung over the bottom part. Mm -hmm. But then... Morris says that it was a one-piece union suit with a metal zipper in the back. You would step into one side and don it like a um, t-shirt would be impossible, in other words. And, and also the hands and feet. They describe different ways the hands and feet would work. So just to break it down and make it simple here, Hieronymus, the, the man who claims he was in the suit and posed as the Bigfoot, claims that it was a two-piece suit of skinned down horse hide and then Morris says he actually sold a one-piece suit that only had a zipper in the back so there's a major discrepancy in their two stories now I would like to point out that both could be true for instance Patterson maybe bought the gorilla suit then modified but it. then decided it wasn't going to work and just, and then made one so both stories could be true or he could have modified it right well, Hieronymus does say there were modifications to the suit, or maybe that, not necessarily there were modifications, but the way he describes the suit would lend itself to the fact that if Morris provided the original suit, modifications were made if Hieronymus was accurate in his description of the suit, and that they added um, football pads for the shoulders, and right. uh, that there was a football mask or something over the mouth, I think he said. And some people say that when you analyze the film, as he turns, the sunlight glints off of one of the eyes. Bob apparently had one glass eye, a glass eye or something. Now, I didn't see that in the footage I saw, but I mean, I'm not an optical expert. I don't know. I know for one thing, I've never seen a gorilla suit. I don't think it was a gorilla suit at all. Because a gorilla suit usually has the plastic chest piece. Mm -hmm. And then, again, it's, it's got the female breasts. I, I just find that, to me, I find that to be somewhat of a convincing piece of it that makes it more real. I don't, I don't know if a hoaxer would have thought that. Maybe they would have because of that 1928, or I'm sorry, the 1955 sighting that the man made drawings and, and showed the female with the furry breasts. So may, maybe they were inspired by that. That's wholly possible but it also seems like a little trouble to it i don't think it's a, i just don't think it's a suit i think if it is a suit it's a homemade suit more like what hieronymus describes but there's a lot of problems with apparently hieronymus isn't a really tall gentleman and the suggestion that he used some type of sticks to move the arms and the wrists and things like that would have been impossible by how fluid the movements are. I agree with that. Another issue, they say if you wear a big bulky suit, that typically the way you walk will be, you know, like if you put on a big padded suit, like that little kid in the Christmas story when he's all wrapped up and he can't barely move and he falls over. Do you remember that scene, mm -hmm. the little brother? Yeah. Well, there, a lot of people are claiming, hey, if you're all bulked up and beefed up inside a suit, you would not be able to walk that naturally. And they said that the legs would have been closer together. And, and whenever the creature turns, you can look clearly through the legs and there's space there. And I mean, I think those are valid arguments, especially the fact that this Bob Hieronymus guy is apparently a smaller person that maybe would have really have bulked up and added height and all these other things to it. Because it is a pretty natural gait. And how high... The creature seems to lift its feet straight up. Now, I'm not saying... I've heard people say humans don't do that. And it was so funny. I was watching a documentary uh, a few months ago, I think, where someone was saying that very fact of if you watch the film, the foot comes up almost vertically from the knee. And they said humans don't do that. And I swear I was started... I turned on a movie after that and was just watching some movie. And some guy was running and, it, and I... <laughs> I happen to notice he did exactly that in that movie. I'm like, well, I guess that's not necessarily true. Was it Steven Seagal? It was not Steven Seagal. 
<laughs> he, oh, he I saw your, funny. I saw your buddy Steven Seagal like shaking hands with Putin the other day up in Russia. Yeah, He's got some Russian ancestry. Apparently, they're BFFs. Him and Vladimir Putin. Yeah, He's never been my hero. I don't know. I don't you talk like, about him an awful lot. I don't like the way he runs. <laughs> <laughs> so I think at the end of the day, we have the film. It's a very compelling film. I think it looks great. I've always considered it a key piece of evidence. Do I think it could be a hoax? I think it's possible. I think that is definitely a possibility. And just on, on the film, what's your, what's your thoughts? With what I know right now, I don't know enough to come away with it feeling one way or the other. So I would just throw it out completely right now. Right. Um, and set it off to the side until I have more time to really go into it in depth. I know that Stanford did a uh, a review of the footage. I think they did some, re- uh, that was in 2007, I think. And then they did another similar uh, review in 2010, came away with some different ideas about it. And uh, they did another one here again in probably 2018. Right. So there's okay. been some very detailed work done on it from a scientific perspective where they've really analyzed the film footage, but they've come away with different conclusion so i'd really like to dive into that a little bit more before i make any determination so right now i set that evidence off to the side to be determined later i wouldn't use it to to say bigfoot's real or not i would just say that's something i'll look at later i i mean it's not good enough or conclusive enough to go either way and and i think you will see if you if you choose to dig into that film even more there will be the people that point out all these tiny minute details and say that is clear evidence in favor of it being a true unknown creature it's a real bigfoot a real sasquatch then the other people will point out other minute details and say this is clearly a hoax someone has come forward and said it's a hoax so why would they do that if it's not a hoax and they will point out this other things that so when you get down to it i don't think anyone will ever really be able to judge it and be able to say 100 percent that that is either evidence or 100 percent it's a hoax it's just going to be one of those enigmas it's it's like the uh, mckinville ufo photos from 1950 probably the most analyzed ufo photos ever the best looking flying saucer photos ever and they've been examined many, many times by many people. You still have all the people that say it's clearly a hoax because of this reason. And other people say it's clearly not a hoax because of these reasons. And they'll do all the measurements and the focal length and all these. I mean, they'll have very good, compelling arguments for both. But in the long run, we'll never know. Yeah, so. There's another really good video that I find very compelling personally. And we are not going to dig into this a whole lot but there is another one if listeners want to check it out on youtube look for a video called paul freeman bigfoot video and you'll come across it several places on the internet mr freeman passed away in 2003 but he was a bigfoot hunter that made several plaster casts he also had some casts that showed the dermal ridges that i was talking about earlier paul freeman in 1982 sighted a bigfoot and he became a bigfoot hunter after that it was near Walla Walla, Washington, and uh, he described it as being nearly eight feet tall and covered with reddish brown body hair. He started spending a lot of time in the woods with a video camera trying to capture Bigfoot. In 1994, he was successful, and he was near the Blue Mountains of northeastern Oregon. I find it to be pretty compelling. I think he, the way he reacts on the video itself is pretty believable but you'll see one bigfoot come sort of down a hill and then another one's there so he actually captures two and it's a good one so uh jimmy did you get a chance to watch that one i think so is he by a pond yes yes and yeah i I looked i thought it was pretty good one i don't know what you think again you know i wish he would have uh maybe had a better camera and uh steadied himself a little bit if he would have had a, a crew with him that you know with a dolly where you could zoom in and some light a light make it perfect everybody would say it was a hoax because it looked too good see that's what i want i I want the movie experience here i want to see good footage there's another documentary it's on amazon prime right now called discovering bigfoot that has todd standing an individual that spends a lot of time in the woods jeffrey meldrum is in that one as well if his stuff is legitimate he's captured some very good videos of bigfoot 
and I think you watched that one, didn't you? You were like, mm-hmm. clearly a hoax, but that's my point. Those look, those videos look so good that everyone's like, well, it just has to be a hoax because they look too good. And so I don't think how, I think the only thing that will ever settle the Bigfoot debate is going to be a carcass or at least some type of fossil record. You just have, an, have to have enough material to do multiple DNA tests. And if you have that, that'd be enough. Tons of hair's been tested, and, and the best they've come up with is unknown hominid. I don't know. There's that Yeti Yeti scalp. Yeah, you know what? Almost all of the evidence that's been, I forget how many, I heard this several years ago, almost every single piece of Yeti, the claw, you know, the hand, the Yeti hand, the mm-hmm. all the scalps, all the fur that's been collected all over Nepal and the Himalayas, every single one of the samples was tested and came out as a Himalayan bear. Yeah. Except, and Except for one, which was a Himalayan wolf. Yeah, the Himalaya bear from the scalp was a previously thought extinct bear bear and now they're thinking maybe like it's a cross between a polar bear and a brown bear and they're seeing those now in the american northwest as you know the habitat for the polar bear shrink they're starting to mate with the brown bears or the grizzlies i don't know which i think it's the grizzly bears brown because it's considered grizzly bear oh is it so so they're calling them growlers or prizzlies and i guess it depends on who you talk to but they're they're mixing the names together well, polar I want bears and a grizzly. Brown bears are very, very similar. They're almost the same species. I mean, that's why they can mate because if you push a polar bear's fur to the side, mm-hmm. uh, it's brown underneath. And they are, I've never been that close. <laughs> that well, I've seen it done. I've never done it. But uh, <laughs> if you uh, and it's obvious that you know brown bears that were in the north in the tundra regions just migrated a little further north around the polar regions and evolved the white fur camouflage themselves against the snow yeah i was unaware though that they have hair samples that they have determined to be unknown hominid 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 H- hominid that's what i've heard i will say this it was on a, doc- a bigfoot documentary so it may be like your it must be true chernobyl helping trees grow <laughs> document <laughs> yeah where i quoted a documentary about radiation helps trees grow but only right. if it's only if the tree's been bit by a radioactive spider <laughs> yeah, so so take that for what it's worth hey did you see back in august of 2020 that a couple of boys in massachusetts found a partially decayed what looks like a foot with toes that was really huge no yeah, yeah. So uh, I saw this. I was I was searching to see if anybody found Bigfoot DNA, and I found the story about it. The police were called. They they took it, but I didn't. I wasn't able to find what the resolution was of the DNA testing on that that foot. Was it just a, a the foot of somebody who had really big feet? You know, like a Andre the Giant type guy, or was it a bear that was misidentified, or or Bigfoot? Could be. Could be a government conspiracy. Why don't you follow up on that? We'll, we'll do a follow-up I've been up on looking. Yeah, episode. I'll keep my... And maybe I can call somebody up there and say, hey, I'm a Bigfoot hunter. I want to know I'm about this. I'm a Bigfoot this. researcher. Yeah, I research big, big feet, Bigfoots. <laughs> and big feet. I, I don't know. I want to know. Big feet, I, Bigfoot. I, I want to start a museum here in West Virginia. Oh, oh, crap. Somebody already did that. Oh, dang it. You should go down to something. Check it out. We're going to go down. We're going to check it out. Let's, let's look at a couple things. Let's mm-hmm. look at what evidence do we really have for Bigfoot? What do we have in favor of Bigfoot? For me, nothing. <laughs> well, I mean, all we really have are a, are a lot of eyewitness accounts of, of footprints. We have plaster cats of yeah, a footprint, sure. Some of them have the dermal ridges, which I find to be a compelling piece of, in, of information. I, I think it would be difficult to hoax that. And if you were a Maybe now that people have heard of that, a hoaxer will be real clever and, and make it. But would anybody really have thought of that up front? Would they even know that? Unless it was an anthropologist that was good, you know, really someone who knew animals very, very well, wouldn't really even know that. An average guy like me or you wouldn't know that. No, I definitely wouldn't know that. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying. And then there was another one when we look at the footprints. This one was made pretty famous back in the 70s. It was a set of big footprints and one of them had a crippled foot all of the anthropology experts from back then that was uh 
uh, Krantz and and now uh, Jeffrey Meldrum also point out that if this was an ape type creature and was very heavy and again it was crippled like the toes are crooked one toe doesn't even make an imprint because it's probably sticking up like it had been crushed and it has two bones two big bulges sticking out on one side and these anthropologists have all pointed out first of all if you're a hoaxer would you make it look like one of the bigfoot feet was crippled would you think of that and the second thing is if you made that crippling injury that looked like a crushed foot if you modeled it after a human foot those bulges would have appeared much further back because of where the marsupial is that what it's called the marsupial essentially the ankle sort of where the foot flexes would be different for a very heavy animal as opposed to a human being would be much further back i found that to be a pretty compelling piece of evidence but i see you sticking your finger up so you must have something on that i I do i could it not be that the the bigfoot hoaxer got an f in art class and instead (laughs) of like a a crippled foot it was just he he sucked at making plaster cast or you mean making the footprints making yeah, either, the pla- making the wooden footprints that you walk around in the mud sure whatever whatever the process is i, I mean i'm not into the hoaxer hoaxer uh, footprint making business so i mean i don't know the techniques i don't spend time you know and i thought you were going to come back with something real hey that is real is that not legit that the, that whoever did it well, I think it's. I think it does point out a, another interesting aspect of, and you have to ask yourself. You're putting yourself in the mind of a hoaxer. So, if I'm a hoaxer, am I just going to make the big wooden footprints and run around in the woods or the snow and try to fool as many people as I can, or am I going to make one with dermal ridges and you know the injury on one foot? And am I going to look it up? Am I going to consult a podiatrist or an anthropologist and say, now if this actually injury occurred, a crushing injury like this occurred, this type of pathology, would it? How would it affect a Bigfoot if it existed as opposed to a human being? I don't know. I think that's putting just a little too much effort into your hoax. Maybe you're ambitious. Maybe, maybe. And again, that's not definitive evidence. I know that, but I think it's a, a good thing, you know, to look at at it and consider it. I think it's a, I think it's a very valid argument for the existence of Bigfoot. And, and you know, other than a few videos and a few pictures and the the famous Patterson Gimbal or gimlin film we have no evidence there is no fossil record of bigfoot we have fossil record of all kinds of prehistoric creatures you know some people say it's the short-faced bear you know which was a bear that was around eleven thousand years ago and died out after the last ice age so i guess there's that but it doesn't mean that we've seen all just because they don't appear in the fossil record doesn't mean that there aren't creatures we've never discovered that lived in the ancient past that we just have no fossils for. But if they did find a fossil that dated, say, nine or 10,000 years ago in North America, and you could point to it and say, you know, when this thing was alive, it could have very well be what everyone's seeing for Bigfoot now. That would help the argument, but it doesn't exist. No carcass exists. No fossil record exists. So those are problems for the existence of this of this creature. One other thing I'd like to point out when we talk about hoaxes and what Ray Wallace did. Uh, again, that's the hoaxer that passed away uh, several years ago, but says that he was the one that made the wooden footprint mechanisms that fooled all the people at the very first official Bigfoot place in Humboldt County, California. And it was also in Bluff Creek, which is where Patterson and Gimlin shot their film. One problem with his, and most Bigfoot proponents will point this out, is they have a flat bottom. When you look at most of the, what they consider legitimate Bigfoot casts, most of the weight is pushed down toward the toes and the front of it. Most of the fake ones, they say they can spot a fake one in a heartbeat because it's perfectly flat and it also doesn't push down in the front um they like as if that creature's rolling its foot and it's flexible they say if somebody's just running around with these you know wooden artificial Sandals. feet that they're flat and another thing is they're so close together i mean some of these feet when a normal bigfoot stride apparently something like three feet in between each step so they say that's another issue with the hoaxed ones and people that are bigfoot hunters 
claim they can go to it and say this is legit and this is not. They also say that most of the faked footprints appear close to highways, close to roads, because the hoaxer wants them to be found. So they're going to put them in kind of a popular area where hikers or, I know in the case of the Humboldt, you know, the construction crew was there and he's playing a joke on his friends. You know, most people want it to be found, but there's been big f- feet, foot. Uh, there's Feetis. been some of these footprints found you know very remote where it wouldn't be found unless somebody hadn't just come across it or there's been a sighting and the researchers go up there and they find them and then some of these footprints and trails go on for miles people have tracked them as far as they can so you know i don't know maybe something there man i think at the end of the day if somebody came out next week and said look we captured one i'd be like yeah okay <laughs> Yeah, sure. I mean, I wouldn't uh, be surprised. But if somebody said came out the next week and said, yeah, we're pretty sure this is all a hoax. Uh, we've proven these 12 cases, which are the best cases out there. We've definitively proven that they're all hoaxes. I'd be like, yeah, OK, I could go either way on this one. What are some of your personal problems that you have with the existence of Bigfoot? Uh, it's extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And for me, I mean, like anything, everybody is at a different place on how much evidence is enough for them to believe in something. For me, I'd pretty much have to have, at at a minimum, some fresh DNA, uh, you know, where a real scientist comes in and says, all right, we've examined You need some fresh DNA. Fresh (laughs) DNA. I need... It's like... where it comes from. (laughs) I saw some guy in a lab one time that said, I've... I've, Because all these Bigfoot people send him uh, poop out of the woods, and he said, I can't tell you how much poop I've examined. You know, because people want me to, want, you know, they think it's Bigfoot, you know, when it's deer, bear, or whatever. You know, I think that's hilarious, too. This th- this poop came from a raccoon, and you yeah. better find him because he has some problems he needs to take care of immediately. <laughs> yeah, he has a bad case of uh, dysentery. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's not long for this world, that raccoon. And some of my problems I have with it is, and I, I gave this a lot of thought before we did this episode, and I, I thought about a lot of a lot of the issues with no really good definitive evidence for Bigfoot. As we pointed out earlier in the podcast, you would need, and I, I heard a biologist say this, and I can't say one way or the other if I know this to be true. He said that you would need at least 500 animals to have a healthy breeding population. That's not a lot, and as big as the Pacific Northwest is, there's a lot of ground to cover. And of course, they say the thing exists everywhere. I mean, there's been sightings in every single state in the Union, I think. Maybe not Hawaii, but probably. <laughs> you know, and, and you know, there is still a lot of wilderness a, and around Alaska and, and British Columbia and, and other parts of Canada. With that small of a population, I think it's possible that it's not going to be seen that much. But on the other hand, one thing I've been a little curious about is I think that most animals that are omnivores, such as bears and raccoons, even wolves and coyotes, are usually attracted to human dwellings and garbage piles and things like that. Now, there has been a few cases where people have been camping. There's been some people that have cabins way out in the woods that say, you know, big foots of big feet have tried to break into their homes. Maybe they're attracted by some kind of food, but bears show up anywhere you have garbage cans, right? Even right here where I live. I mean, I kind of live in the country, but not way out in the country. And we have a little park that the bears start coming. If they put trash, they have to put these bear-proof trash cans all over the place here in West Virginia. Why aren't more Bigfoot caught in, in the garbage can? You know, why aren't they attracted to to the same things that other animals that are similar to them? So that's that's an issue that I have. I mean, maybe there's not enough of them. Maybe they avoid humanity. I get that. But usually animals are attracted to an easy meal, an easy free meal, which would be to raid someone's trash can. Also, the fact that we have very little photographic or film evidence, and you had pointed out that before, that, hey, look, not everybody's ready to take a a picture. Not everybody's ready to take a film. Most people are going to be shocked, and and the, the encounter only happens for a few seconds. And that's the same issue we have. UFOs. And then again, most of the ones you see, most people just automatically say they're fake anyway. So for all I know, some of the ones that are out there are very good and just nobody 
believes it. I guess it's possible. But but I do take a little bit of issue that we've not been able to capture more pictures and video, especially uh, some of these anthropologists and nature filmmakers have spent a lot of time in the woods looking for Bigfoot. And they've followed up after these sightings and things. And I mean, these are people that are good at finding mountain leopards and things that are rare in the world that we know of. And they typically can can find them in nature. They've just never really been found and documented. Where I come out at the end of the day, it could be... I, I could go either way with it too. I think I'm leaning just a little bit more in favor though of Bigfoot being a real creature, being a real phenomenon of some type listeners let us know what you think just email us and say bigfoot's real bigfoot's not real and also if there's any info you think we should know if there's some piece of evidence that would point everyone in the world toward a movie a documentary a piece of film footage a piece of bigfoot dna to help convince jimmy fresh dna fresh um Then, you know, let us know. So I think we better start wrapping this thing up. Do you have anything else? Yes. The plural of Bigfoot is Bigfoots. I don't know about that. I was reading something else that said Big Feet. So who's to say? Well, the only place that says Big Feet is, okay, Word Hippo is the only place that says Big Feet. Word Hippo? Come on. Word Hippo. Who's going to believe Word Hippo? I'm on the occult section, which is a website, and it's Bigfoots. Bigfoot is not a subject of the occult. Cryptozoology, pseudoscience, maybe, but definitely not the occult. Quora says it's Bigfoots. Oh, wait a minute. You know what I like the best is just Bigfoot, like saying I saw three Bigfoot. Oh, here's another one. In the Bigfoot forums, it says it's Bigfoot, no S. Some questions just can never be answered. (laughs) I'm going to go with Bigfoot. Okay. It is both the singular and the plural. Anybody out there have like a definitive answer for me? Hit me up. First yeah, contact at CosmicSponge.com. One last thing I want to mention real quick. <laughs> okay. Uh, this better be good. Another thing that got Bigfoot really cranked up in the public consciousness when I was a kid, mm-hmm. there was a movie called Legend of oh, Boggy Creek. Creek. Yeah. When that came out, Bigfoot exploded all over. There was all kinds of TV specials about Bigfoot again. There was all these things. I'm about eight years old, you know, when this thing came out. And I remember being scared to death of Bigfoot. And I figured out that my bedroom window was about eight foot off of the off the ground and they showed a little picture of a bigfoot standing next to you know a a man and i was like oh my god he could look right in my bedroom window you know (laughs) (laughs) well i just and uh but anyway that was go ahead do you know do you do you remember what state that uh took place in i think it was in texarkana region in a little town called Fook, and i think it's known as the Fook monster Mm -hmm. yeah so it's a little corner of arkansas and actually in the south a creature similar to bigfoot is known as the skunk ape and i think once again there you go it must be the same species because it stinks real bad that's my favorite one the skunk ape (laughs) skunk ape yeah i always think of i I always think of an ape wearing a bunch of skunks (laughs) 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 yeah just a stinky old ape (laughs) he points the skunks at whoever's attacking him but you know it's funny you know we laugh about that kind of stuff but you know i bet there's old timers and people that spend a lot of time in the woods hunters heard tales from other people and thing i mean i'm sure they totally believe it if it if there is something like that in their area you know that they come across a skunk ape or uncle jim did or Mm -hmm. or something you know or the oral history um, right yeah All right. Well, I think that's it for Bigfoot. Again, like I said, we were just trying to do an overview of Bigfoot, a little bit of history, talk about where we come into it. We may do some deep dives on the subject of Bigfoot. We may do some deep dives on some particular encounters as we dig a little bit more into this subject of cryptozoology. And hopefully... Uh, the people that just opened the West Virginia Bigfoot Museum will be reaching out to us in the next couple of weeks. We will have them on the show, which I think would be great and to have somebody else to badger about whether you believe in something or not. <laughs> no, I wouldn't badger anyway. I hope you're not listening right now. <laughs> 
No, it'll be a nice, friendly discussion, as always. So that is it for this week. I'd like to remind everyone to please rate and review the podcast. That helps bump us up in the ratings so that others can find the show. If you have a story to tell, some type of extraordinary encounter, let us know. We would like to share it with the listeners on the show. If you want to remain anonymous, just let us know that up front. You can find us in at first contact at CosmicSponge.com. We are on Facebook under Cosmic Sponge, and a lot of people's found us already. And we are on Instagram. And I am just still amazed at how many downloads we're getting from all over the world. I mean, it, it just blows me away. We have listeners in Gusenhausen, Bavaria. <laughs> Gusenhausen? Yeah. We just got a couple downloads from Estonia recently. We got some from Australia. I mean, we we have uh, we have quite a few in in Europe, mm-hmm. so that's fantastic. I hope everyone is being very entertained, and don't be afraid to reach out to the show. Let us know what you think, or if you have topic suggestions, or you have info for us, you know, just or just email us and say hello. We we would love that. So next week on Cosmic Sponge, we are going to dive into the ocean and explore USOs with the tale of Shag. Harbor. I like the way you use the dive, the deep dive on Shag Harbor. Yeah, yeah. You know, so it's yeah. Pretty nice. And and that's a story uh, from our neighbors to the north. Yep. It should be pretty exciting. Canadian UFO that crashed in the ocean in 1967, I think. Right. I haven't started my research yet. So we're going to do the deep dive, do a little research on it, and we will be covering that next week. So be sure and tune in. This is Stephen Hawk signing out, and we'll see you next week. Jimmy Co. Ditto. That's all for this week's episode of Cosmic Sponge. Please don't forget to rate and review us wherever you listen. It helps others find the show. If you have any questions or have a story you'd like to share, you can contact us using our email account, firstcontact at cosmicsponge.com. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you next week.